Lord Jesus, we ask for your mercy as we attend, uh, attend your word, as we approach your throne, we ask for your grace that you teach us to see the world as you see it, see ourselves as you see us, see your word through your eyes and by your Holy Spirit that we'd be able to understand it and apply it to our own lives. It's, it's a joyous thing and at the same time almost a shocking thing to see this young man that his life was completely turned around by the gospel and has immediately turned to follow you and be a real genuine disciple. We ask that we can take your example and be the kind of people you want us to be. Amen. <clears throat> John chapter 51, I'm going to read through the last nine verses of the chapter 8 here. <clears throat> you remember he had been talking to believers in verse 30. Uh, unbelievers, the Pharisees, jumped in and argued with him. And <clears throat> now he's speaking to the Pharisees, to the unbeliever, unbelieving Jews anyway. Uh, in verse 48, they accused him of being demon-possessed. He said, no, that's not true. Verse 51, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, <clears throat> if a man keeps my saving, sayings, he shall not never see death. He shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, again, it's the unbelieving Jews. There were believing Jews back in verse 30. These unbelieving Jews kind of took over the conversation. They said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets are dead. And, and, you, and you say, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? <clears throat> Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him. Remember, this is that Gnosko knowledge, the experiential knowledge. They don't know him. They know about him, but not even much of that. <clears throat> he says, you don't know him. Uh, verse 55, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I would be a liar like you. Getting personal there. <clears throat> but I know him, and I keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. See, now they thought they had him. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you think you've seen Abraham? Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, passing through the midst of them, and so passed by. So this is the second or third time that we've seen him just walk away when people were trying to grab him. And in the one time, they explain, he explained that it was, it was not his time. So he's the one in control. And the fact that they wanted to grab him or wanted to stone him or anything else didn't make any difference. They, in Capernaum, they tried to throw him over a cliff. Uh, in the temple, at one point, they tried to grab him and force him to be king. No, that wasn't in the temple. That was at uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, another time, they wanted to arrest him, and none of the officers could lay hands on him, and so forth. <clears throat> and here's just one more. But the title of today's message is, Before Abraham Was, I Am. <clears throat> now, last week, we didn't look at the concept of finding freedom in Christ because Jesus said in verse 32 you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and we discovered that there it was this gnosko knowledge the experiential knowledge of him as the truth because in verse 36 it confirmed that the son shall make you free so it's him that we're to know <clears throat> and when he offered that freedom it was specifically offered to the believers because the believers were the ones he was talking to. In verse, in verse 30, it says many believed on him. In verse 31, it says that he was answering those people. He says, then said Jesus to those Jews who believed, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <clears throat> he was speaking to believers. But the unbelievers were offended by that. <clears throat> What we also saw is that what he offered them was freedom from the power of sins in their daily life, from its, its constricting power around their lives. 
as well as gaining permanent freedom from the eternal penalty of sin, which he had already offered, clear back in John chapter 5, verse 24. We were able to determine that only believers were eligible for either of these two aspects of this promise, and either of these two aspects of freedom. And it follows that only people who have been freed from the penalty of sin so they no longer face the judgment of God will also be able to look forward to the eventual freedom from the presence of sin when we're in God's presence, that, that all believers will be enjoying that freedom from the presence of sin for eternity. <clears throat> so the eternal freedom from the penalty of sin that Jesus paid for at the cross and which was granted to you the moment you believe, that's yours forever. God's never going to judge you for sin. Jesus said that. John 5, 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him who sent me has, present tense, eternal life, and shall not, future tense, come into condemnation. You're never going to be judged by God. But have crossed over. This is actually perfect tense. It means it happened in the past but has a permanent effect on the future has crossed over from death into life. That was his promise in John 5, 24. So the promises he's making in this passage are actually pretty skim milk compared to what he said in John 5, 24, and this is the one that the Pharisees are choking on. But that eternal present, freedom from the presence of sin is also yours, guaranteed by the presence of the Lord, by, by being there in his presence. You're never going to be around sin again. It'll have no effect on you. But you're not going to experience that in this life. In this life, there's always going to be sin around you. You've always got a sin nature that you're going to have to deal with internally. <clears throat> Randy was talking about some of that warfare that's in our lives right now. You know, each of us has our own fights to fight. In my case, it's, I've had chronic depression since I was 15 years old. And yet, God's given me a measure of victory for the last 20 some years. I've had a pretty stable walk with God, and I haven't had any medications. It's, it's not dependent on whatever it was, Prozac, I guess, uh, or any of the other medicines they gave me. It's actually based on actually walking with God. Huh? Yeah, but the fact is the light of God is what's shining through our darkness. That's exactly right. <clears throat> Each of us has our own sources of darkness. But that freedom from the power of sin experienced in our lives today is what Jesus was inviting the believing Jews from verse 30 to, in, to learn and experience. He told them that if they continued in his word, they would become his true disciples, that means followers, and he told them that they would experientially know, gnosko, knowledge, the truth, which that turned out to be himself, and that he would make them free. We saw that concept reiterated in verse 36 where he said that the Son would make them free, the Son of God, God the Son. <clears throat> we also saw that while the believing Jews may have rejoiced in his promise, the Pharisees, who were also present, were offended by his promise of freedom. Now, you wouldn't think that that would offend somebody, but the first thing they thought is, we never needed freedom, we have freedom, we're free. They were slaves right then. They were slaves to Rome as they spoke. And they'd been enslaved in Egypt for 400 plus years, and and they'd been uh, under under tribute to their enemies many times in their history. You can read through the Book of Judges and see how many times they were enslaved by their enemies. Uh, so for them to say they've never been anybody else's servant but God, I, I just think, what are you smoking, man? You're absolute fools to be able to say something like that. It's un unbelievable that they would say that in the context of other believing Jews, other Jews that knew the word. That, that they had to have been looking at each other and say, what are they talking about? Of course we've been enslaved before. <clears throat> and the believers knew that they'd been enslaved to sin, and that's what Jesus was offering them freedom from. So when these people were offended, Jesus changed who he was talking with and directed his, the rest of his, of his statements to them, saying that if they had been of God, as they claimed to be, they would have received him and honored him because he was of God. He says that if you were of God, you'd, you'd love me. If I were of the world, the world would love me, but it doesn't. And later he said that to the believers, as if you're of the world, the world would love you. It loves its own. 
we talked about that. We said that, you know, the world doesn't attack the cults. They don't care about them unless they really do something bad. You know, when Jim Jones managed to kill 900 people, yeah, people got, that got people's attention. But until then, he was just this wacko preacher in eastern Oregon or wherever he was. Uh, nobody really cared. Okay. Nobody goes and tries to make what they believe illegal. <clears throat> It's the, it's the Christians that are going to keep attacking, and the Jews that are going to keep attacking. <clears throat> so he said, because they were not of God, they could not receive the words he spoke, and they dishonored him in spite of his truth. Verse 48 through 50 says that those Jews, the unbelieving Jews, says, then answered the Jews and said to him, say we not well that thou art a Sumerian and hast a devil. They accused him of being demon-possessed and a half-breed, not even a real Jew, he's a Samaritan, which... Come on, that's total baloney. They knew where he was from, <clears throat> or they thought they did. And Jesus answered and said, I have not a devil. I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. I'm under somebody else's microscope, not my own. One has to consider, even as a believer, whether one's words and actions honor the Lord. I shared this in the evening Bible study years ago. <clears throat> oh, 1978, I guess. <clears throat> I had a fellow who claimed to be a believer. He was actually a Bible teacher of sorts, telling me various kind of Madison Avenue approaches that he felt that churches and missionaries specifically ought to engage in to squeeze more money for the ministry. And I expressed my repugnance for that kind of behavior and he said, well, Chet, the bottom line is it works. And I climbed up because, A, he was a good deal older than I was, and he was enjoying some respect by all the other people around. And, I, I, and for another thing, I just wasn't sure what was wrong with what he had just said. It took several hours of his statement echoing in my mind before it finally dawned on me. That is not the bottom line. That is never the bottom line for believers. The bottom line for believers is, does it honor God? The church is not in, in business to make money. Missionaries aren't there to, to wring more money out of their supporters. They're there to, there to do God's work and to depend on him, not their own ability to, you know, to milk people, which is effectively what he was talking about. <clears throat> the bottom line is never to be what works. The bottom line is always to be what honors God. <clears throat> There's lots of things in our world that are perfectly legal, but they're completely immoral, and they never honor God. And I'm not going to go into a long list. You know them as well as I do. You can look around our country and see particular places where grossly immoral things are perfectly legal. You can look at the whole country and see that grossly immoral things are perfectly legal and being taught in our schools. And that's not honoring God. So the fact that something is legal or okay in your society does not mean that it honors God. You have to decide for yourself, am I going to be, obey God or not? <clears throat> now Jesus didn't seek glory or honor or wealth. He sought to carry out the directives of his Father. Now you remember back in John chapter 4 when Jesus stopped in Samaria, in the city of Sychar, at the city well, <clears throat> he was already, I mean, he was staying there while his disciples went into town to get food and he's already kind of on the thin edge of doing something that all the high-ranking Jews would have hated. The fact that he was in Samaria at all was, oh, I just thought that was terrible. You don't want to go there. The fact that he was sitting there and talking in a public place with a Samaritan woman, yeah, man, he crossed the line. She was shocked by it. His disciples were astonished by it. It says there. They saw him speaking to the woman and they were marveling that he was speaking with her. Whoa, where are you going with this? Okay, But he wasn't there to get anybody else's approval. He wasn't there to, to gain social standing. When he publicly held that conversation with the Samaritan woman, he'd crossed the line in everybody's eyes. And even his disciples were astonished. But his motivation became clear in the next few verses when he said, My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what made Jesus tick. 
That's what wound him up and got him going, is to know that he was in the will of his father and that he was completing the, the job that he'd been sent to do. So the, the, the result of his doing what God said instead of seeking glory from other people is that before he left Sychar, there was a whole bunch of saved souls who had been lost two days earlier. He stayed there a couple of days. They would have hated that. You not only went into Samaria, but you stayed in a Samaritan city for a couple of days? Yeah, that's right. He led people to the Lord. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, you can read that whole story because the immediate result was the salvation of a whole bunch of lost souls in Sychar. What happened after that? We don't know. We have to just leave them in God's hand because it doesn't go and tell us what the future was in their lives. Probably that Norwegian preacher in Nairobi never knew what happened with this young man that he led to the Lord that went home and is, is now heading up a church of, of, I mean, we would count the little kids. I'm counting that baby Rose back there. She's brand new, and I'm still counting her. He's not counting the kids. He's only counting the adults. He's got 79 people that are there and hungry to be fed in the Word. That's pretty special. But that guy from Norway probably will never know until he goes home to be with the Lord, unless Job happens to meet him again and tell him, hey, remember me? Probably not. He said there was like 97 people that went forward at the same time as him. Three days later, he was gone. <clears throat> the Pharisees, had they realized that Jesus sought no personal honor but only sought to please and honor his Father God, it should have changed their attitude toward him. But they hated him, and they just wanted him silenced. They're absolutely not interested in what he was teaching, except that it, it, it constituted a threat to them. That's the way they saw him. That's the only thing they saw. This is borne out later in John chapters 11 and 12, where in John chapter 11, Jesus raised the dead, his friend Lazarus, uh, Mary, and Margaret, Mary and Martha's brother, raised him from the dead, and these same kind of people, I don't know if it was the exact same people, but they were there to see it. In John chapter 12, it says they were counseling together as how to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. They wanted him silenced. It wasn't even just him. They wanted the whole message shut down. So in verses 51 through 53, Jesus answered him. <clears throat> he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know you have a, de a devil, a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If a man keeps my saying, he'll never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Whom makest thou thyself? It says in King James. See, Jesus made the blanket statement that whoever kept his word would never die. Well, A, we need to find out what does it mean to keep his word. Does it mean to obey the whole Old Testament? Because that's his word too. No, actually we've already seen that it didn't. <clears throat> How could he promise? See, they pointed out that Abraham and all the patriarchs and the prophets were dead. Their point was that if all the greats of their faith had died, what was he claiming? How was he, could he claim otherwise? How could he promise that if someone kept his word, they would never die. You want to remember back in John chapter 3, verse 16, he said, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It didn't say who obeyed the whole law. Uh, in John chapter 5, we already quoted today, he said that he that heareth my word and believeth on him who sent me has eternal life right then. We find over in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things I have written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have everlasting life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants you to know that you have eternal life. Not hope, not guess, not working for it, I'll get there. No, no, you can know right now, today, that you have eternal life. And that is the gospel that we're sharing with people. To me, that's a pretty simple message. That you can have eternal life today, and Jesus will tell you how. Okay, so he'd made this promise. <clears throat> this is nothing new. And they, get, they didn't get it in either of these other things because in John chapter 4, verse 14, and in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, he promised the indwelling Holy Spirit, who he said would be springing up within the believers as a fountain of, of living water flowing to eternal life, springing up unto eternal life. <clears throat> 
So what he's saying right now wasn't anything terribly new. It was actually a kind of a condensed version of what he'd been promising all along. <clears throat> but they seized upon his words and they challenged him again. And Jesus answered and said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. But you've not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like you. But I know him, and I keep his saying. Uh, I, I believe at this point he's deliberately, deliberately making it personal. That they've been lying, saying they do, uh, do know him. And he said, if I said that I didn't know him, I'd be lying like you. But from the opposite standpoint, because I do know him. <clears throat> so Jesus took him back to this issue of honor. He said, if I were to honor myself, it would be valueless. But he said that the Father was honoring him. And he reminded him of what he'd said earlier, that they didn't have an experiential, relational knowledge of God, but that he himself did have that personal, relational, and experiential knowledge of God. He concluded that if he were to knuckle under and imply that he was just like them, that he didn't know him either, that he'd be making himself into a liar. Then he went on to say, in verse 56... I have to get that up a little closer. My eyes are getting old. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, Abraham was a prophet, and he had seen the coming deliverance, and he had rejoiced to see that day coming. Furthermore, Abraham had seen Jesus face to face. When? Well, do you remember something about a beef sandwich and a glass of milk? Actually, it wasn't that specific. He said he fed him beef and bread and butter and milk. That's what I would do if I had beef and bread and butter and milk is make a beef sandwich and have a glass of milk. Probably that's not what they did. That's not how they eat in the Middle East. But that's who he fed that stuff to. It was God in the flesh. It was a Christophany. It was Jesus standing right there when he offered it and sat down under the oak trees there in the shade while Abraham prepared dinner and fed him and the two angels who were with him. You can read it. Genesis chapter 18. Pretty heavy reading once you realize who he's talking to. And then read John 1.18 where it says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him unto us. The only member of the Godhead who frequently shows up in the form of a human and speaks with people, talks with them, is Jesus. When you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's Jesus. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his throne filled the temple, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, it was Jesus. When Daniel saw the, the uh, ancient of days seated on the throne and his hair was white as snow and so forth, that was Jesus. Jesus shows up all through the Old Testament. By the way, that's what our evening Bible study is all about, is finding Jesus in the Old Testament. We're just starting Deuteronomy next week this week I guess this is Sunday this week but we've been seeing Jesus over and over so Jesus told them your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad and they said to him thou art not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham the Jews were just incensed by that statement too and so they started deriding Jesus saying you young pup you're not even 50 years old yet, and you think you've seen Abraham? <clears throat> and here's the, here's the clincher. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, in today's English, we would say, well, your, your grammar's kind of fouled up there. You know, when you start off in past tense, you need to keep it in past tense. Nope. Now, see, did the, the, the Jews jump right in and try to correct his grammar? They say, hey, mister, apparently you also missed out in grade school learning to keep your, your tenses the same in agreement, you know, in a sentence. No, that's not what they did. They picked up rocks because they were going to try to stone him to death. Why? Because they knew exactly what he meant. <clears throat> they knew that what he'd said was clearly blasphemy unless it was true. See, and they didn't want to consider the possibility that it was true that he really was who he said he was. They knew that Jesus was using the eternal I am, the great I am, as the, the, the way the, the Old Testament God 
identified himself to the believers starting in Exodus chapter 2, I think. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 2, I think, is where Moses said, well, who am I going to say sent me? And he says, tell him I am sent you. That's the great I am. And they saw that he had used it as if he himself was God. And the fact is, that's exactly what he was doing. The Pharisees had no, no question about his intent. They knew he had just claimed to be the God of Israel. I can understand why they were upset. The problem is they would only be blasphemy if it was not true. And they were not going to be considering the fact that it might be true. Why would they not look back to, say, Isaiah 7.14, where it says, The virgin shall be with child, and shall call his name it shall bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. Oh, so maybe that had been fulfilled. Nope, not even going to consider it. They had no question what he was saying, but they weren't going to consider the possibility it might be true. When Jesus had earlier claimed to be the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12, they'd missed the point. They didn't like it, but they missed the point because for him to be the light of the world means he had to be the light of the Gentiles and the light of Israel, and there's only one person that could be the light of Israel, let alone the light of the Gentiles, and that was God. And he was physically the light of the world before people were created, before he put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky. He was the light. And guess what? At the other end of the time spectrum, the sun and the moon and the stars are gone. And Jesus is the light again, Amen. physically light. Okay. They missed the point. When he claimed to be the bread of life that came down from heaven, they missed the point on that one too. They were offended by it, <clears throat> if you read John chapter 6. But they still didn't make the connection that he was also claiming to be their sustainer as well as their sustenance that he was the one providing the bread of life, that he himself is the bread of life, that he's the one. You know, when he quoted scripture to turn Satan away, he says that it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is that bread of life that came down from heaven. See, that's only the beginning, because there's five more great statements of I am that are still coming in the book of John where Jesus identifies himself in pretty unmistakable terms. But this one we're reading today is the capstone of all of them. There's seven plus that one. This one is where he let them know for sure what he was saying with all the rest of them. There's seven great I am statements in the book of John. But this one is the title for the whole thing. And they understood it exactly. And the, their only thought was to kill him. And that proved that what he's been saying about them was completely true. Because you remember back in verse 44, he said, You're of your father the devil, and his works will you do. Verse 45 says, He was a murderer from the beginning. And when he speaks a lie, he's speaking his own language. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. So here they are. They're only concerned with the lie that they wanted and to kill the truth and the author of truth. They're proving him correct. <clears throat> and they still were not able to carry out their murderous intent. It says they took up stones to cast at him. Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. They weren't able to carry out their intent. He was still the one in control, and his time had not yet come. He just walked out through the midst of them. So who are we dealing with here? Not the Pharisees, Jesus. Who are we dealing with? See, all of us know these facts. Well, let's, take, let's, let's think about this. See, I, th I think we tend to forget who Jesus really is ourselves. We don't slander him. At least I hope we don't. We hear the, word sl the world slander him a lot. I don't think we do that. I don't think we, I don't think we go so far, though, as to, to realize very frequently that he is identical to the God who spoke the world into, into, into existence. He's that God. Uh, if Hebrews chapter 1, God the Father, speaking to God the Son, says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the world, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. 
they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all, all shall wax old as doth a garment, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's God the Father speaking to God the Son. Hebrews chapter 1, check it out. I don't think we think about that very often. I'll explain why in a minute. <clears throat> Everything in the world is created by him, also created specifically by his authority. He spoke, and things just popped into being, fully developed. No evolution. You know, no chance aberrations from the norm. No, he spoke them into existence. And I love it because if evolution had made things, there wouldn't have been nearly the plethora of different kinds of things. That doesn't need to be. You know, if there's only one kind of pollen, there's only one kind of bug that's needed to keep them going. And there's a few of those around. There's a big bird in Papua New Guinea in northern Australia called the cassowary. It's about that tall. Uh, it's dangerous because if it takes the notion it can, with one kick, disembowel you. Um, Fortunately, they're pretty rare. But see, they pretty much only eat this one kind of fruit. It's a fruit about as big as a tennis ball, or maybe the size of a baseball. Uh, it's got a great big seed in the middle of it, and that's what they eat. They swallow these things whole. And they haven't got a very efficient digestive system, so they, they digest the fruit off the outside of the seed, and they pass the seed on through them. And it just so happens that that is the only way that fruit will ever, that seed will ever, what do you call it, germinate, is if it was eaten by one of those birds. And that kind of bird only eats that kind of fruit, and that kind of fruit can only be germinated by that kind of bird, which can only, that's what evolution would give you. And yet, God created that one too. It's a gloriously beautiful bird. You just don't want to get too close to them unless there's a, you know, eight-foot cyclone fence between you and them because they can run, jump, and climb, too. They don't fly, fortunately. The females are huge, and the males look like a giant turkey. <clears throat> See, I think we kind of forget who he is. When we do think about these things, we momentarily rejoice at his creativity and his power, but we still feel free to just go do our own thing. I do. I mean, I'm, I'm a free moral agent. I feel like going and watching TV all evening, I'll just do that. I feel like taking off and doing something else instead of doing what God says to do, I'll do that. You know, spending time in the Word, well, I don't feel like that right now. Oh, well, you don't feel like it. Well, there's who your God is then. It's how you feel. I'm going to do what I feel like doing. I don't know why we can get from this point where we see God as the total creator who's an absolute authority and that the only things in the history of the universe that have ever disobeyed him are the demons and us. We're not in real good company. But I don't know how we can go from that point of view to this other thing that says I can do what I want. It's because we still have a sin nature and that's the voice of our sin nature speaking. Think about the, the disciples who were in the boat with Jesus when he calmed the storm. Now, these were commercial fishermen. They knew what a real storm is. They knew that in this case, it's not just rough out here. We are in danger. We're about to die. Jesus was zonked out. He was so tired from preaching and teaching and healing people, he was asleep in the bottom of the boat. And they woke him up and said, Master, don't you care? We're all going to die. And he stood up and says, Why are you scared? And told the storm hush and it totally quit right then the wind stopped i've seen wind stop suddenly but there's nothing no natural force that can suddenly stop wave action and if you've lived close to a beach you know exactly what i'm talking about there's a tremendous power there it has to be dissipated the energy has to finish doing what it's doing nope not when jesus speaks it's done right now and and they all said hallelujah boy that was fun is that what they did no, it said they were more afraid of him after they saw him calm the storm than they were of the storm that they were sure was going to kill him. It says, then they were exceedingly afraid. Why? It says, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, maybe he's the manner of man that we ought to take that same attitude toward and obey to. See, that's what the heart of discipleship is about, is recognizing who Jesus is and choosing to follow him. And yet, after this experience that all these commercial fishermen had with him, 
In John chapter 21, we see that Jesus, not Jesus, Peter was the ringleader. And he says, well, I'm going back to fishing. And all the rest of them said, yep, we'll go with you. So there they were when Jesus called them for the last time to get out of the boat and go do what he told them to do. He called Peter specifically because this was the fourth time that Peter had had to be called away from the fish. That's why Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these fish? That's the them he was talking about in that passage. That's an interesting passage all by itself. You can go back and read it again. But Jesus called him away from those fish for the last time, and he redirected their thoughts to his command. Now, after they received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, this is 10 days after Jesus' ascension, they never seemed to have lost sight of their objective anymore. They all seemed to have faithfully walked with him after that and done what he called them to do. They had their struggles, but they did what he was calling them to do. So the final question is, what about us? See, each of us has already been born again. Each of us already has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So why are we so easily distracted? Because that's what it is. Why, why do the things of the world so easily entangle us? In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the writer there begs us to consider all that have, have gone before us, all these champions of the faith that we've seen in the Bible, and take their example. He says, wherefore, this is, this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, a lot of people look at this and they think, you got all these people watching you. No, they don't. They're not watching you. They're done watching you. They're watching Jesus now. They were testifying to you in the previous chapter, in Hebrews chapter 11. Those are the witnesses testifying to you, this is what God can do through your life if you'll let him. That's why they were witnesses. Seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that great cloud of witnesses, everybody we ever read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament who walked with God, it cost them in many cases, and went ahead joyfully serving God in spite of what it cost them. Those are the great cloud of witnesses. They're testifying to you. You can do it. You know, there's an old joke, and I'm sure those listening on, on the podcast won't understand this because it's an Oregonian joke. Why did the Oregon chicken cross the road? Well, it's to show the possum that it could be done. <clears throat> In other parts of the world, I'm sure there's something other than possums that are always getting run over by cars, but you don't see too many dead chickens on the road. <clears throat> That's what those people were doing, doing, is they're showing to us possums that it could be done. It's possible to walk with God. It's possible to lay aside these weights that so easily entangle us and the sin that so easily entangles us and go ahead and walk with God. You see, any runner, I don't care if it's an Olympic runner or somebody running for their life because somebody's after them, what if, what's the first thing they do? Drop whatever heavy thing they're carrying unless it's something so precious they can't lose it, like your baby, and run. Drop your backpack, run. Drop your whatever it is you're carrying, run. I know there's counter examples. There's a guy that ran a marathon in full field pack and combat boots and everything to represent the U.S. Marine Corps. He did pretty good, evidently, too, but I'd have died in the first mile. So in my case, drop it all, run. Okay, And that's what he tells us to do. Whatever is holding you back, drop it and run the race. He calls us to lay aside the sin that so easily besets us. Now, what is there in our lives that regularly trips us up? What passions do we regularly obey that are detrimental to our obedience in Christ? Well, these are questions for self-examination. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody except myself to look at myself and say, okay, what is it, Chet, that you usually want to do instead of whatever God calls you to do? See, the, the, the command is there for all of us to see, so we have to take that personally. And finally, he commands us to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
Take him for our example of commitment and obedience. It says it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross and despising the shame of that cross. And as the eternal champion, the eternal victor, the winner of that race, he has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God the Father. Well, what does he call us to do? He says to emulate his example, not just sit on the sidelines and cheer for Jesus and say, whoa, that gives me a thrill to even think about it. He says, get off your butt and get in the race. Drop the flag. Drop your ditty bag full of snacks that you didn't have to buy at the concession stand. Get in the race. Get in the game. I called you to be part of this, not just to sit on the sidelines and cheer about me. Enter the race yourself and run. That's what I love about just this morning, or actually yesterday I got the first one, and this morning got another one from that fellow in Kenya, is that the first thing he did three days after he was born again was get off the grandstands and get into the race and start running. And the result is, here just a relatively short time later, he's got 79 adults plus all their children meeting to study God's Word together. Okay. You see, the Pharisees to whom he was speaking, they were his enemies. Most of them were never going to believe him. They were never going to join him in the race. It was the believers that he made that invitation to. If you keep my word, you'll be my, if you stay in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. They'll follow him. They'll, they'll be like him. They'll learn from him. And be set free from their sins by the power, by his power in their lives. Now that extension, that invitation has been extended to us as well. And I hope we're the kind of people that are going to take him up on it because that's what he's inviting us to do as well, is to get off the bleachers, get in the race, and walk with him. Reap the benefits that he promised. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, we'd ask you to stir our hearts to follow you, to follow your example. Teach us to look for your will and to listen for your voice. Teach us to read your word, see in your face in the pages, and obey your commands faithfully. Make us the men and women of God you called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.